everybody, my name is Rick Pidcock, and today I'm going to be talking about an article that I recently wrote for Baptist News Global. It was released on November 25th, 2020, and it was entitled, What the Big Bang and Wholeness Have Taught Me About Facebook. And um, so basically what I want to do over the next little bit is just kind of talk through the article and expound on uh, some of the things that, that I was exploring in the article. And just to begin with, like, I've had a very um, odd relationship with social media, to say the least. I, I started on, um, you know, back in the MySpace days, and, uh, you know, uploaded some music there, and, you know, had dreams of making it big, and, and then MySpace lost all of our music. Uh, at some point in the past, I don't remember when exactly it was, but then eventually I, I gave into the pressure and signed up for Facebook in 2009, and it was a really fun time because you know I could get together with uh, you know friends from high school, college, and um, you know pretty much most of the people in my life were really on the same page as I am on a number in a number of ways. You know, we were all um, we'd grown up mostly conservative Christian. Um, I went to a, a university called Bob Jones University, and in my young adult uh, years, I had a very particular way of viewing uh, religion and politics, and um, and and for the most part. You know, there may have been some differences, but for the most part, um, my friends agreed with me. And um, but over the past five years, in particular, I started going through a significant shift in in both my theological and my political views. And if you've been paying any attention at all to American politics and religion over the the past four years, in particular, um, you know, I think it's. It, Anybody, no matter what side of the aisle you're on or what your religious persuasion is, um, I think we could we could all admit that the last four years have been very strife filled, and that social media has been a, a very big part of that. And so, you know, in my experience, um, you know, I've, I've I've had a number of frustrations with with Facebook in particular. Uh, the you know different ways that people interact with me, like like one. One example is where they'll 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 tell me that I'm wrong, and then they want to argue with me, uh, you know, on something that I've posted about. And then it's like um, in the Christian world, you can get into these like you know verse wars, where it's like we shoot these verses at each other like they're missiles. You know, well this Bible verse says this, and this well this Bible verse says that, and it counteracts that verse, and then you know, and you get this back and forth little Bible verse missile war going on, and. Um, <laughs> And, and, and then some people, it's like, you know, I don't ever, I kind of made it a rule. Like, I don't go on other people's walls to, like, tell them that they're wrong about something and argue with them. But for some reason, like, there's some people that love to do that. And and they'll go on my wall and they'll tell me I'm wrong and try to argue with me. And it's, it'll turn into, like, you know, 150 comment argument. And then I'll see them on other people's walls. I'm like, how do you have time to do all this? Like, like how many people are you arguing with at a time? How do you keep all this straight? And then there's there, there's some where they'll they'll uh, they'll come on my wall. You know, I'll post something that I I want to make a some kind of nuanced point. But then they'll come and they'll ask like an unrelated, totally literalist question and expect me to answer them. You know, and, and then you know, you know, and then they'll accuse me of of being unwilling to answer a simple question. You know, so I'll I'll in my more recent years, you know, I'll say something about religion. Then somebody comes in and they're like, "Do you believe that Jesus is the only way to you know salvation to get to heaven? You know, literally that he literally rose from the dead." And I'm like, like that's not what we're talking. I'm trying to talk about something else here, and you're trying to derail the conversation into something else. I have thoughts about those things, but that this isn't the time or place to deal with that. But you know. For some reason, they expect that if they ask the question, that they're they're you know now that's where the conversation needs to go. Um, you know, some you know over the past four years, I've I've gotten some friendships with people that are part of some marginalized groups, um, you know, racial minorities and even people within the LGBTQ community community, and um, I've got these friends. Um, that I'm with on Facebook, and they'll occasionally comment on some of the things that I post, and then someone else comes along, and they'll want to belittle them. 
and um, you know I'm I'm just I'm not not gonna gonna have that happen on my wall. Um, you know, some people you know, they'll swoop in and they'll try to make a joke. You know, they'll make fun of me or something, and then you know claim they're just joking. You know, I shouldn't take this so personally. Um, you know, others. You know, somebody else might come in and and they'll like they'll make a really inflammatory comment that I just know is going to tick all my other friends off. And so, if my friend, if some of my other friends were like able to like resist getting into the fray, all of a sudden here comes somebody and swooping in, throws a nuclear bomb into the conversation, and then ever everybody's got to swarm in and 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 go after them. Um, and then and and then there's you know. The, the labeling where it gets a bit more personal and you know over the past you know four years or so like you know I've been called a heretic or a false teacher on my own wall and and these are from people that like previously we were really good friends and um you know or acquaintances and and, and it's like you you knew me like you knew what what I believed you knew where I was at um and suddenly you've got to label me with this um, because we disagree on something and you don't even really know fully what I believe on some of this stuff. So, um, you know, there's this claim that, that people have where they say, you know, if you post something publicly, you're opening yourself up to public criticism. And while I, I can understand what, like the point there to some degree, on the other hand, it's like, is that really the case? Like, like, am I beholden to have to take all of these shenanigans uh, simply because I post my thoughts or feelings on Facebook? Um, I now have to open myself up to all of that. And uh, there's a psychologist named Sherry Turkle who wrote a book called Alone Together. And, and in that book, she explores how computer technologies has have really invaded our relationships. They've rewired our understanding and um, of friendship and authenticity, and they've really left us feeling alone. And then there was an article in The Atlantic in 2012 by somebody named Stephen Markle or Marsh, and um, he said that the, uh, that the loneliness and depression that Facebook fuels has revealed that he says, quote, a connection is not the same thing as a bond, and that instant and total connection is no salvation, no ticket to a happier, better world, or a more liberated version of humanity. And so I want to focus in on this concept of considering social media within the larger context of salvation, or as he defines it, as a more liberated version of humanity. And um, to begin exploring that, we need to understand who we are as relational beings. And so, first of all, and this is going to sound a little woo-woo, um, but it's uh, when you look at the science that, that we've come to understand about the cosmos, you really do begin to see that we are transcending wholeness. And, um, you know, the universe, scientists have, have been able to, to discover, it began about 13.8 billion years ago in a dimensionless point of energy called the singularity. And, and, and shortly after the, the Big Bang, these, these particles began to draw together, and, and they, they began to form this circular dance. And, and as they came together, they began to bond. And, and when they bonded, um, in their bonding, they transcended to create an atom. So then you've got these atoms, and they come together, and in this circular dance, they begin to bond um, as they're drawn together by gravity, and then they, in their bonding, create a molecule. And so on and on, each stage of the universe grows and expands as into new wholenesses um, that that contain the uniqueness of the wholeness before of the wholenesses before. And so you've got the individual um, wholenesses that come together to create a, a more transcendent wholeness. And, and this is like literally baked within everything in the universe. The, the stars, um, you know, they had the, the, the necessary elements for life in their core, in the center of, of, of who they were. But in order for that to get out and, and to produce life, the stars had to die and then explode. And then the center of who they were 
were it was able to resurrect in in life and to create the elements necessary for life. And so we contain those elements in our skin, in our bones. And that is who we are. We, we contain the story of the unfolding universe of transcendent wholeness in our very bodies, in our minds. And so secondly, not only are we transcending wholeness, but we're also evolving complexity. You know, it, evolution tells us that um, we, we, we used to be reptiles, and then we evolved into mammals, and then we evolved into homo sapiens. And you can see that in each stage, we were transcending toward greater complexity while bearing the marks and the behaviors of what came before. And so, you know, our reptilian brain, our brain is divided into three main sections. The reptilian brain is anxious, but it keeps us alive by sensing threats. Our, our, our mammal brain is hungry, but it drives desire and pleasure. And our primate brain is what builds our social and cognitive and linguistic and creative connections. And so your, your brain is this intricately um, connected uh, you know, relationship of energies between the different parts of your brain. And it, again, is all been grown over billions of years through the story of evolution. And, and so, imagine, and, and also, your brain is connected to every part of your body as well. So, imagine the depths of complexities within your mind and body, and, and you have no idea how complex the web of, of relationships within just your body is. Now, you introduce one other person into the, into the picture with all of their complexities, and suddenly, your complexities are, are, are meeting their complexities, and there's an entirely new consciousness going on here of even greater complexities as you interact with one another and, and feed off of one another's energies. And, and then you not only have two people, but you get an entire family of complexities, and then a neighborhood or a social community, a church, a school, a workplace, your city, an entire nation. And, 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 and this web of relationality, this evolving complexity, is, is something that we can't even, we can't even <clears throat> fathom. And so third, we are, uh, we are emerging consciousness. In her book, Reenchanting the Earth, Ilya Delio explores the evolution of consciousness. And, um, and so she, uh, she refers to this concept of the preaxial consciousness. And this is where, uh, as humans began to emerge, our, our consciousness was very mythical, was very tribal and ritualistic. And so, you know, this is when, uh, you know, humans were, were going around in, in tribes. And, and you, may, you may be in your tribe, but you're not really interacting with that many other, other, other tribes. And, um, and when, when things are going wrong, you... you in your relationship to the cosmos, or you know, your food's not growing, you create these r- rituals, these sacrifices to the gods in order to appease them, in order to deal with whatever the problem is, and 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 hopefully in order to get their favor again. And this is the way humans thought about the cosmos, and and then as as tribes began to interact over time, suddenly they began to be aware of neighboring tribes and of the way that they thought about things. And when you started to, when individuals started to interact with other tribes' ideas, suddenly some of them would begin to question their own tribe's ideas. And <clears throat> so, so that's when the axial consciousness began to evolve. And this is very individualistic and rational. And so this is when, you know, hierarchical powers structures began to uh, come into place. And um, in this this hierarchy way of viewing the world, this is this is the world that the church and and eventually America would would grow would grow in. And so you've got this hierarchy in the you know specifically in the Catholic Church and and all of the power dynamics that was there, and if you're at all familiar with church history, you're you're you, it's kind of a depressing story of of again violence, separation, tribalism, 
and um, and then all of a sudden, and so there's a lot of wounding going on, and then all of a sudden Copernicus comes along, and he confirms the the suspicions that had been growing that the Earth revolves around the Sun, and and suddenly the Church has a problem because. In the in the the way the church viewed things, there was a hierarchy. The the whole cosmos was a hierarchy where you had God at the top, and you had you know the different divine beings, angels, what have you. Then you had man, humanity, and then you had the animals. And in humanity, um, you had the image of God, and so God is imaged in humanity, who is the center of the earth, and the earth is the center of the cosmos. And so when all of a sudden Copernicus says, oh, actually the earth isn't the center of the cosmos, well then suddenly man is not the center of the cosmos. And if humanity is not the center of the cosmos, then what does that say about God, who's imaged in humanity? And so there was a decentering that happened. And, and so then you got the Protestant reformers, they come along. And they're dealing with, like, the wounds from the hierarchy that they had been, you know, hurt by. But then also this, this whole decentering of humanity in the cosmos. And so they developed this theology where God is central and sovereign over every single thing. You know, when you're, it's like, you know, when you're out there and you're kind of, you know, away from, you've broken away from the hierarchy and you're not really sure your place in the cosmos. It's like, okay, if we have God at the keep God at the center of everything and keep him sovereign and control over everything, then you know, we'll be able to have hope. <clears throat> and so that's what the Protestant reformers did. The problem was then science kept on exploring and science kept on discovering things. And, um, you know, as long as science could stay within the, the, the fixed cosmos of Newtonian physics, you know, Christians could make that work. But once science began to move more and more toward an evolutionary perspective, especially with, you know, in connection with deep time and, and how long the cosmos has been, evolved, has been around, you know, Christianity, Christian theology really began to become more divorced from the cosmos of unfolding wholeness. And so, it began to shift its focus more to the next world. You know, it wasn't so much about this world, it was about getting raptured and going on to heaven when you die. And um, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And um, and as a, as a consequence... As, as, as Christians moved on to the next world and started focusing on that, we ended up with the 20th century being the bloodiest century in world history. And, and then, as human desires for, for salvation and immortality remained, they, they began to not really look for them in religion, but instead began to shift to technology. And suddenly, you have this technological boom in the 20th century that eventually would lead to the internet and ultimately social media, which would connect individuals and tribes, not just within their own local communities, but literally across the entire globe, across religious spaces, across political uh, divides. And, um, and, and all of this, this, this wholeness, this complexity, this consciousness uh, really created a very complex situation. So, you end up logging onto Facebook. And every time I log onto Facebook, it says in the, um, in the little status bar thing, it says, what's on your mind, Rick? And I'm just thinking, like, like what's on my mind? Like, I have no idea. The depths and the complexities of this entire 13.8 billion year story in my body, in my mind, coming to this space to type what's on my mind, like, we're just beginning to become aware of 
of the complexities and the relationships of what's on our mind. And, you know, I have my wholeness and my complexities on my mind, but also the wholeness and complexities of those around me. And, and, and Facebook is a place and social media is a place where you ha- now have an entire globe of people longing for wholeness and filled with unknown complexities who are all converging together. And so it's like, you know, it's like the Apostle Paul said, I, I, the things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I, I, I want to do, I don't do. And it's like, like, yeah, like we get that now. Like we, we, we understand that in, in science, modern science can tell us, can begin to pull back the curtain of our minds and show us why that is. Like we don't know what's going on. Um, in, uh, in his book, The Future of Man, Teilhard de Chardin said that the earth is, is forming a global networked mind. And um, this was, he said this before social media. He didn't even know about the internet, let alone if he knew about the internet and social media. Um, Ilya Delio uh, says that technology such as social media, she says, quote, arose as nature's cry for connectedness and wholeness an effort to transcend our crippled individualism. Our crippled individualism is what led us into just nonstop retributive violence and separated and cut off from one another and cut off from ourselves. And, and, and technology is, is our cry for connectedness. It's our cry for wholeness. And, and um, going back again to that, that article I mentioned at the beginning in The Atlantic, where uh, Stephen Marsh said that um, we're seeking a bond that leads to salvation as a more liberated version of humanity. And, and if that's the conversation that we're having is, is ultimately about salvation and a liberated version of humanity, then I think Christians is, should be especially interested in that conversation. So, so we are transcending wholeness. We're evolving complexity. We're emerging consciousness. And, and finally, knowing, beginning to become aware of what is on our mind, we are becoming liberated humanity. And that's the final section of my article that I explore. Um, I explore how, how certain Christian theologies have, have cut us off from experiencing the universe's unfolding wholeness. And I'm not going to get into all of those details here. If you want more information on that, you can check out the article. Um, you can also check out some of my other articles. Uh, they may make you uncomfortable at times. Um, this is an ongoing conversation. At times, I'm, I'm quite direct in, in my writing, but um, this is a, something that we need to come to terms with. And, um, and we'll, we'll carry this conversation in different ways over, over the years um, as I write and as I, I share more uh, different um, ways of communicating. And, um, but there are theologies of disintegration that are cutting us off from ourselves and our neighbors and our God. And, and we need to be able to face those things and, and deal with those things. Um, quite, quite frankly, they, these theologies of disintegration are, are fueling a subconscious trauma that we feel in our minds and in our bodies. And, and, it's not, and this is not just you know, poetry speaking here. This is the story of the entire cosmos. The cosmos is unfolding, transcending, converging, evolutionary wholeness. And, and when we cut ourselves off into this crippled individualism and we isolate ourselves from that and we believe that everyone is this you know, free individual who um, knows what choices they're making and is responsible for that, like, like we, have, we have no idea what's going on. And, and, and we're creating all kinds of trauma in, in people with this way of, uh, these ways of viewing the cosmos that, that is, you know, separating us from one another. And so when I post something to Facebook and, and somebody holding to a theology of, of disintegration comes along to tell me how wrong I am, to tell me I'm in, I'm in danger, to label me a heretic, a danger to others. All of that trauma that I felt from that uh, theology in my life comes to the surface again because it's in me and um, it's being healed, but it's, it's always in me. And, and so, you know, you might say, well, you know, you, 
you should put you shouldn't put it out there for public consumption. Your thought out there for, for public consumption if if you don't want to get pushback on your idea, and and it's like you know this this situation isn't just me posting an opinion and you disagreeing. There is an entire universe of subconscious relationships going on here that you know I, you know and I have a thousand friends, most of whom uh, hold to what I would call. A theology of disintegration, and um, that led to a lot of trauma for me, and 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 so you know somebody might say, well, you shouldn't feel that way, and you know if that's the case, then I would say um, you know you don't understand the depths of the complexities that of the relationships that are in my mind and body and and in your mind and body, and um, and so and so on Facebook, you know I. I feel a lot of personal pain. I, I feel a lot of personal pain because it comes from people that I know. Um, and because, going back to the, to the science of this web of relationality that we have, like, um, when, when I go on Facebook, it's, it's, the pl- it's the people that I have the strongest web of relationality with. And when, um, you know arguments and those, you know, the verse bombs go off, it's showing me where those webs have been cut. And, and so that hurts a lot more. Uh, you know, I go to Twitter and, um, to be honest, I'm, I'm a lot more unfiltered on Twitter and, um, you know, and, and, and on Twitter, it's like, uh, you know, because they're strangers. And so I, I tend to be more unfiltered there, and um, but just because my friends and family aren't there to disagree with me all the time, that doesn't mean that I'm I'm liberated on Twitter. Um, what it probably means is that I'm venting some of my trauma there, and and you know I need to be aware of that. And and on the other hand, it's like to make this even more complex. Like I want to be a writer, and I want to be a communicator, and I want to grow my audience professionally. I have books I want to write, articles I want to write, podcasts I want to do, and um, you know I'm told I have to have a following there on Twitter. You know, it's like well, I've got like what 390 followers. It's like nothing, you know. And um, but you know whatever it is, what it is. Um, but I'm being told by, you know, all the, the people who supposedly know it all that, yo, you've got to build a big following on Twitter. But on the other hand, it's like Twitter's the space where, um, I can share what I think about certain things without, um, you know, and, and, and the pushback I might get is mostly from strangers. So it's not going to hurt as much. So then I'm dealing with a lot of trauma. Well, Twitter becomes a very complex place for me. Um, and, and so, uh, it's 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 really kind of kind of a mess. Um, the whole the whole the whole social media situation that we find ourselves in, and so um, but becoming aware of this, you know, through self awareness, can come self compassion, and through self compassion, can come self love, and uh, that that is something that that I was never allowed to even really consider self-love. Um, but, you know, Jesus talked about love your neighbor as you love yourself. So I almost see that not only as a command, but as kind of a statement of reality. You love your neighbor as well as you love yourself. And unfortunately, for many of us, that's not very well, because if we're cut off from ourselves, and we don't look at ourselves with compassion. Um, we're not even aware of ourselves. We're not going to be aware of our neighbor. We're not going to have compassion for our neighbor. We're not going to love our neighbor. And and so, when you can love yourself for the depths of, of transcending wholeness and evolving complexities and emerging consciousness that you are, then I think the words of Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, like that that kind of becomes our posture. Like, we have no idea what we're doing. So, you know, when that's your posture to yourself, 
it can overflow into an awareness and a compassion and a love and a posture of forgiveness toward your neighbors uh, and, and, and toward your enemies. And, and so, like it or not, technology is evolving us. The, the individual is becoming more tribal. The, tribal. the tribe is becoming more global. And you know, tech, uh, Delio says that technology is extending the outreach of the human person into global domains. And so, if we can move deep within ourselves, within, with love, into this 13.8 billion year old story of unfolding wholeness and evolving complexities and emerging consciousness, and if we can harness that with the power of social media, not to cut us off and to separate ourselves, but to build relationships within our own minds and bodies and between our minds and bodies and extending through our networks to the entire globe, then I think that's where we need to take social media. I have no idea what that looks like. Don't look at my social media as a good example of that. Um, I'm, I'm just becoming aware of my own complexities at this point. But I think that we need to be aware of the story of the cosmos and the story of our bodies and minds and, and how we relate to one another and, and begin this conversation of self-awareness that can lead to self-compassion and self-love that overflows for our neighbor and um, if you're in the God conversation for God. So if you want to read the article, go to baptistnews.com. Uh, you can look up Rick Pidcock, or you can also search uh, What the Big Bang and Wholeness Have Taught Me About Facebook. And um, I'll probably do uh, some more of these uh, conversations on some other articles or other thoughts that come up. I'm a little busy with school, um, to say the least. But I've enjoyed this, and I hope it will uh, be helpful for some. Thanks. <laughs>